Hello and welcome to Old Book Gold. I'm your host, KG. With me is my co-host, Forrest. Hello. And before we get started with today's episode, Forrest has an announcement to make. Yes, so it's been two years now since we've launched this channel, and we're so happy to be reaching nearly 400 subscribers at this point. We've thrown just about everything at the wall to see what would stick, what we're best at creatively, and how we can entertain an audience, and we believe we've reached a place with the most confidence in what we can do. That being said, Opa Gold will continue as usual every week along with the expansions through Spoon we've already mentioned. It's our most viewed series and we have people who come back each week, so it's pretty obvious what's working. In addition to Old But Gold, every Wednesday I will be uploading an episode of my podcast, The Pancake King, Life and Marriage on the Spectrum, which is about my experiences on the autism spectrum and what marriage is like for me with another person on the spectrum. I'm sure you can guess who that person is. As for gaming videos, I'll continue periodically putting out videos of me playing Borderlands with a few friends, but otherwise those will be very few and far between. Audio dramas will be limited to mortal deity until further notice. Finally, if you'd like to listen to my podcast in a different way, it's already out on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts for you to listen to on the go. You can also subscribe to my Substack, where I talk more about autism, at thepancakeking.substack.com. Thank you for keeping the feedback coming, for voting in the polls to help direct the future of our channel, and for being so supportive. We really appreciate it, and we hope you stay with us. We started this channel and worked on it during a pandemic. We can't wait to see how this channel continues to grow. Now on to The Last Command by Timothy Zahn, Chapter 16. The planet was green and blue and mottled white, pretty much like all the other planets Hana dropped in on over the years, with the minor exception that this one didn't have a name. Or spaceports, or orbit facilities, or cities, power plants, or the ships, or much of anything else. That's it, huh? He asked Mara. She didn't answer. Han looked over and found her staring at the planet hanging out there in front of them. Well, is it or isn't it? He prompted. It is, she said, her voice strangely hollow. We're here. Good. Han said, still frowning at her. Great. You going to tell us where this mountain is? Or are we just going to fly around and see where we draw fire from? Mara seemed to shake herself. It's about halfway between the equator and the North Pole, she said. Near the eastern edge of the main continent. A single mountain rising out of forest and grassland. Okay. Han said, feeding in the information, hoping the sensors would loop out and fail on him. Mara had made enough snide comments about the Falcon as it was. Behind him, the cockpit door slid open and Lando and Chewbacca came in. How about it? Lando asked. We there? We're there, Mara said before Han could answer. Chewbacca rumbled a question. No, seems to be a real low-tech place. Han shook his head. No power sources or transmissions anywhere. Military bases? Lando asked. If they're there, I can't find them. Han said. Interesting. Lando murmured, peering over Mara's shoulder. I wouldn't have pegged the Grand Admiral as being the trusting sort. The place was designed to be a private storehouse, Mara reminded him tartly. Not a display ad for Imperial hardware. There weren't any garrisons or command centers scattered around for Thrawn to have moved into. So, whatever he's got will be stashed inside the mountain? Han asked. Plus probably a few ground patrols just outside, Mara said. But they won't have any fighter squadrons or heavy weaponry to throw at us. That'll be a nice change, Lando said wryly. Unless Thrawn decide to put up a couple of garrisons on his own. Han pointed out. You and Chewie'd better charge up the quads, just in case. Right. The two of them left. Han shifted into a general approach vector, then keyed for a sensor search. Trouble? Mara asked. Probably not. Han assured her, watching the displays. But there's nothing showing anywhere around them. A couple of times on the way in, I thought I spotted something hanging around back there. Carazian thought he saw something when we changed course at Ober Sky 2, Mara said, peering down at the display. Could be something with a really good sensor stealth mode. Or just a glitch, Han said. The Fabritech's been giving us trouble lately. Mara craned her neck to look out to starboard. Could someone have followed us here from Coruscant? Who knew we were coming? Han countered. No, there was nothing there. Must have been his imagination. How much of this private storehouse did you see? Slowly, Mara turned back to face forward, not looking all that convinced. Not much more than the route between the entrance and the throne room at the top, she said. But I know where the Sparty Cylinder Chamber is. 
How about the power generators? I never actually saw them, she said. But I remember hearing that the cooling system pulls in water from a river flowing down the northeastern slope of the mountain. Probably somewhere on that side. Han chewed at his lip. And the main entrance is on the southwest side. The only entrance, she corrected. There's just the one way in or out. I've heard that before. This time it's true, she retorted. Han shrugged. Okay. He said. There's no point in arguing about it. Not until they look the place over, anyway. The cockpit door slid open, and he glanced over his shoulder to see Luke come in. We're here, kid. He said. I know. Luke said, moving forward to stand behind Mara. Mara told me. Han threw a look at Mara. Near as he could tell, she spent the whole trip avoiding Luke, which wasn't all that easy on a ship the size of the Falcon. Luke returned the favor by staying out of her way, which wasn't much easier. She did, huh? It's all right. Luke assured him, gazing out at the planet ahead. So that's Wayland? It's Wayland, Mara said shortly, unstrapping and brushing past Luke. I'll be in back, she said over her shoulder, then left. You two work so well together. Han commented as the cockpit door slid shut behind her. Actually, we do. Luke said, sliding into the co-pilot seat Mara had just vacated. You should have seen us aboard the Camaro when we went in to rescue Card. She's a good person to have at your side. Han threw him a sideways look. Except when she wants to slide a knife in it. I'm willing to take my chances. Luke smiled. Must be one of those crazy Jedi things. This isn't funny, Luke. Han growled. She hasn't given up on killing you, you know. She told Leia that back on Coruscant. Which tells me that she really doesn't want to do it. Luke countered. People don't usually go around announcing murder plans in advance, especially not to the victim's family. You willing to bet your life on that? Luke shrugged fractionally. I already have. The Falcon was skimming along the outer atmosphere now, and the computer had finally identified a probable location for Mount Tantus. Well, if you ask me, this isn't a good time to be running short odds. He told Luke, giving the sensor map a quick study. A straight and southern approach, he decided, that would give them forest cover for both the landing and the overland trip. You have any suggestions? Luke asked. Yeah, I've got one. Han said, changing course toward the distant mountain. We leave her with the Falcon at the landing site. Alive? At other times in his life, Han reflected, it wouldn't necessarily have been a question. Of course alive, he said stiffly. There are a lot of ways to keep her from getting into trouble. You really think she'd agree to stay behind? No one said we had to ask her. Luke shook his head. We can't do that, Han. She needs to see this through. Which part of it? Han growled. Hitting the clone factory or trying to kill you? I don't know. Luke said quietly. Maybe both. Han had never liked Forrest very much before joining the Rebel Alliance. Which wasn't to say he disliked them, either. Forrest was simply not something the average smuggler thought about very much. Most of the time he picked up and delivered in grimy little spaceports like Moss Eisley or Abogado Ray, and on the rare occasions where you met in a forest, you let the customer watch the forest while you watch the customer. As a result, Han had wound up with a vague sort of assumption that one forest is pretty much like another. His sin with the Alliance had changed all that, but with Endor, Corstris, Fege, and a dozen more, he learned the hard way that each forest is different, with its own array of plants, animal life, and general all-around headaches for the casual visitor. Just one of the many subjects the Alliance had taught him more about than he'd really wanted to know. Wayland's forest fit the pattern perfectly, and the first headache proved to be how to get the Falcon down through the dense upper leaf canopy, without leaving a hole that any wandering Imperial TIE pilot would have to be asleep to miss. They'd first had to find a gap, in this case made by a fallen tree. Then he had to basically run the ship in on its side, a lot trickier maneuver in a planetary gravity well than it was out in an asteroid field. The secondary canopy, which he didn't find out about until he was almost way through the first, was a second headache, and he tore the tops off a line of those shorter trees before he got the Falcon stabilized and down, crunching a lot of underbrush in the process. Nice landing. Lando commented dryly, rubbing his shoulder beneath the restraint strap as Han shut down the repulsor lifts. At least the sensor dish is still there. Han said pointedly. Lando winced. You're never going to let that go, are you? Han shrugged, keying in the lifeform algorithms, trying to find out what was out there. You said you wouldn't get a scratch on her. He reminded the other. Fine. Lando grumped. Next time, I'll destroy the energy field generator and you can fly her down the Death Star's throat. 
Which wasn't all that funny. If the Empire got enough of its old resources back again, Thrawn just might try to build another of those blasted things. We're ready back here. Luke said, poking his head into the cockpit. How's it look? Not too bad. Han said, reading off the display. Got a bunch of animals out there, but they're keeping their distance. How big are these animals? Lando asked, leaning over Han's shoulder to have a look at the display. And how many to a bunch? Luke added. About fifteen. Han told him. Nothing we can't handle if we need to. Let's go take a look. Mara and Chewbacca were waiting at the hatchway with R2 and Tripio, the latter keeping his mouth shut for a change. Chewie and me will go first. Han told him, drawing his blaster. The rest of you stay sharp up here. He punched the controls and the hatchway slid open as the entry ramp lowered, settling into the dead leaves with a muffled crunch. Trying to watch all directions at once, Han slid it down. He spotted the first of the animals before he reached the bottom of the ramp. Gray, with a freckling of white across its back, maybe two meters from nose to tail tuft. It was crouched at the base of a tree limb, its beady little eyes following him as he walked. And if its teeth and claws were anything to go by, it was definitely a predator. Beside him, Chewbacca rumbled softly. Yeah, I see it. Han muttered back. There are another fourteen out there somewhere, too. The Wookiee growled again, gesturing. You're right. Han agreed, slowly eyeing the predator. It does kind of look familiar. Like those panthek things from Mantessa, maybe. Chewbacca considered, then growled a negative. Oh, we'll figure it out later. Han decided. Luke, right here. Luke's voice came down from the hatchway. You and Mara start bringing the equipment down. Han ordered, watching the predator closely. The sound of conversation didn't seem to be bothering it any. Start with the speeder bikes. Lando, you're high cover. Stay sharp. Right. Lando said. From above came a handful of pops and clicks as the transport restraints around the first two speeder bikes were knocked off, then the faint hum as the repulsion lifts were activated. And with a sudden violent crackling of leaves and branches, the predator leaped. Chewie! Was all Han had time to shout before the animal was on top of him. He fired, the blaster bolt catching it square in the torso, managed to duck as the carcass shot past his head. Chewbacca was roaring wiki battle cries, swinging his bowcaster around and firing again and again as more of the predators charged at them from out of the trees. From the hatchway, someone shouted something and another shot flashed out. And out of the corner of his eye, moving much too fast to avoid, Han saw a set of claws coming in his direction. He threw up his forearm across his face, ducking his head back as far out of the way as he could. An instant later, he was knocked back off his feet as the predator slammed full tilt into him. A moment of pressure and lancing pain as the claws dug through his camouflage jacket. And then suddenly the weight was gone. He lowered his arm, just in time to see the predator bound onto the ramp and prepared to spring for the falcon. He twisted around and fired, as just a shot from inside the ship also caught it. Chewbacca snarled a warning. Still on his back, Han swung around, to see three more of the animals bounding across the ground toward him. He dropped one with a pair of quick shots and was trying to swing his blaster around to target the second when a pair of black-booted feet hit the ground just in front of him. The animals leaped upward into a blurred line of brilliant green and crashed to the ground. Rolling over, Han scrambled back to his feet and looked around. Luke was standing at a half-crouch in front of him, lightsaber humming in ready position. On this side of the ramp, Chewbacca was still on his feet with three of these speckled animals lying dead around him. Han looked down at the dead predator beside him. Now that he got a good, close look at the thing. Watch out. There are three more over there. Luke warned. Han looked. Two of the animals were visible, crouched low down the trees. They won't bother us. Any of them get into the ship? Not very far into it. Luke told him. What did you do that set them off? We didn't do anything. Han said, holstering his blaster. It was you and Mara turning on the speeder bikes. Chewbacca rumbled with sudden recognition. You got it, pal. Han nodded. That's where we tangled them, all right. What are they? Luke asked. They're called Geralds, Mara said from the ramp. Crouching down, her own blaster still drawn, she was peering at the carcasses scattered around Chewbacca. The Empire used to use them as watchdogs. Usually near heavily wooded frontier garrisons where probe droid pickets weren't practical. Something in the ultrasonic signature of a repulse slip that's supposed to sound like one of their prey animals draws them like a magnet. So that's why they were sitting here waiting for us. Luke said, closing down his lightsaber but keeping it handy. They can hear a ship size or pulse slip coming in from kilometers away, Mara said. Jumping down off the side of the ramp, she dropped to one knee beside one of the dead girls and dug her free hand into the fur of his neck. Which means if they've been radio tagged, the controllers of Mount Tantus know we're here. Great. Han muttered, crouching down beside the dead girl at his feet. What do we look for? A collar? Probably, Mara said. Check around the legs, too. It took a few anxious minutes, but in the end they confirmed that none of the dead predators had been tagged. 
Must be descendants of the group they brought in to protect the mountain, Lando said. Or else this is where they came from originally, Mars said. I never saw their home planet listed. It's trouble either way, Han said, shoving the last carcass off the Falcon's ramp to crunch into the leaf cover below. If we can't use the speeder bikes, it means we're walking. From above came a low electronic whistle. Pardon me, sir, Tupio asked. Does that also apply to R2 and me? Unless you've learned how to fly, Han asked. Well, uh, sir, it occurs to me that R2 in particular isn't really equipped for this sort of forest travel. Tupio pointed out primly. If the cargo plant can't be used, perhaps other arrangements can be made. The arrangement is that you walk like the rest of us. Han said shortly. Getting to a long discussion with Tripio wasn't how he'd been planning to spend his day. You did it on Endor, you can do it here. We didn't have nearly as far to go on Endor. Luke reminded him quietly. We must be about two weeks' walk from the mountain here. It's not that bad. Han said, doing a quick estimate. It wasn't that bad, but it was bad enough. Eight or nine days tops. Maybe a couple more if we run into trouble. Oh, we'll run into trouble, all right, Mara said sourly, sitting down the ramp and dropping her blaster into her lap. Trust me on that one. You don't expect the natives to be hospitable? Lando asked. I expect them to welcome us with open crossbows, Mara retorted. There are two different native species here, the Pasadans and the Minirshi. Neither of them have any great love of humans even before the Empire moved in on Mount Tantus. Well, at least they won't be on the Empire's side, Lando said. That's not likely to be a lot of comfort, Mara growled. Now, whatever trouble they don't give us, the usual range of predators will. We'll be lucky to make it in 12 or 13 days, not 8 or 9. Han looked out at the forest, and as he did, something caught his eye. Something more than a little disturbing. So, we'll figure on 12, he said. Suddenly, it was critical that they made tracks away from here. Let's get to it. Lando, Mara, you get the equipment pack sorted out for carrying. Chewie, go pull all the ration boxes out of the survival packs that ought to do us for extra food. Luke, you and the droids head that way. He pointed. And see what you can find in the way of a path. Maybe a dry creek bed. We ought to be close enough to the mountain to have some of those around. Certainly, sir. Tupio said brightly, starting down the ramp. Come, R2. There was a muttering of acknowledgement, and the others headed into the ship. Han started toward the ramp, stopped as Luke put a hand on his arm. What's wrong? He asked quietly. Han jerked his head back toward the forest. Those carols that were watching us, they're gone. Luke looked back. Did they all leave together? I don't know. I didn't see them go. Luke fingered his lightsaber. You think it's an Imperial patrol? Or else a flock of those prey animals Mara mentioned. You getting anything? Luke took a deep breath, held it a moment, then slowly let it out. I don't sense anyone else nearby, he said. But they could just be out of range. You think we should abort the mission? Han shook his head. If we do, we'll lose our best shot at the place. Once they know we've found their clone factory, there won't be any point in pretending they're just some overlooked backwoods system anymore. By the time we got back with a strike force, they'd have a couple of Star Destroyer fleets waiting for us. Luke grimaced. I suppose so. And you're right. If they tracked the Falcon in, the sooner we get away from it, the better. Are you going to send the coordinates back to Coruscant before we go? I don't know. Han looked up at the falcon looming above them, trying to think about the Imperials getting their grubby little hands on it again. If that's a patrol out there, we'll never get the transmitter turned tight enough to slide a message past them. Not the way it's been acting up lately. Blue glanced up too. Sounds risky, he said. If we get into trouble, they won't have any idea where to send a follow-up strike force. Yeah, well, if we transmit through an Imperial patrol, I can guarantee that's trouble. Han growled. I'm open to suggestions. How about if I stay behind for a few hours? Luke suggested. If no patrols have shown up by then, it should be safe to transmit. Forget it. Han shook his head. You'd have to travel alone, and there's a better than even chance you wouldn't even be able to find us. I'm willing to risk it. I'm not. Han said bluntly. And besides, every time you go off alone, you wind up getting me in trouble. Luke smiled ruefully. It does seem that way sometimes. Bet on it. Han told him. Come on, we're wasting time. Get out there and find us a path. All right. Luke said with a sigh, but he didn't sound all that upset. Maybe he'd known all along that it wasn't a very smart idea. Come on, 3PO R2. Let's go. 
The first arrow was the hardest. The vague path-like trail R2 had found deadened into a mass of thorn bushes after less than a hundred meters, forced them to push a path of their own through the dense undergrowth. In the process, they disturbed more than plant life, wound up spending several tense minutes shooting at the nest of six-legged, half-meter-long creatures that swarmed out biting and clawing at them. Fortunately, the claws and teeth were designed for much smaller game, and aside from a nicely matched set of tooth dents in 3 left leg, no one suffered any damage before they could be driven away. 3 moaned more about that than either the incident or the damage really deserved, the noise possibly attracting the brown-scaled animal that attacked a few minutes later. Han's quick blaster shot failed to stop the animal, and Luke had to use his lightsaber to cut it off 3 arm. The droid was even more inclined to moan after that, and Han was threatening to shut him down and leave him for the scavengers when they unexpectedly hit one of the dry creek beds they had been hoping to find. With the easier terrain and with no further animal attacks to slow them down, they made much better speed. And by the time the leaf canopy overhead began to darken with nightfall, they made nearly ten kilometers. Brings back such wonderful memories, doesn't it? Mara commented sarcastically as she got out her backpack and dropped it beside one of the small bushes lining the creek bed. Just like back on Mirker, Luke agreed. Using his lightsaber to cut away another of the thorn bushes they'd become all too familiar with in the past few hours. You know, I never did find out what happened after we left. About what you expect, Mara told him. We cleared out about two steps ahead of Thrawn's AT-ATs, and then nearly got caught anyway when Card insisted on hanging around to watch. Is that why you're helping us? He asked her. Because Thrawn's put a death mark on Card? Let's get one thing clear right now, Skywalker, she growled. I work for Card, and Card has already said that we're staying neutral in this war of yours. The only reason I'm here is because I know a little bit about the Clone Wars era, and don't want to see a bunch of cold-faced duplicates trying to overrun the galaxy again. The only reason you're here is that I can't shut the place down by myself. I understand, Luke said, cutting a second thorn bush and closing on his lightsaber. Reaching out with the force, he lifted the two bushes off the ground and lowered them into the creek bed. Well, it won't stop anything that's really determined to get at us, he decided. Studying the makeshift barrier. But it should at least slow them down. For whatever that's worth, Mara said, pulling out a ration bar and shipping off the wrapping. Let's just hope this isn't one of those lucky places where all the really big predators come out at night. Hopefully, our two sensors can spot them before they get too close, Luke told her. Igniting his lightsaber again, he cut two more thorn bushes for good measure. And he was preparing to shut it down when he caught the subtle change in Mara's sense. He turned, to find her staring at his lightsaber, ration bar forgotten in her hand, a strangely haunted expression on her face. Mara? He asked. You all right? Her gaze shifted almost guiltily away from him. Sure, she muttered. I'm fine. Throwing him a quick glare, she bit viciously into the ration bar. Okay. Closing down the lightsaber, Luke used the force to move the newly cut thorn bushes into place on top of the others. Still not much of a barrier, he decided. Maybe if he stretched a few of those vines between the trees. Skywalker? He turned. Yes? Mara was looking up at him. I have to ask, she said quietly. You're the only one who knows. How did the Emperor die? For a moment, Luke studied her face. Even in the fading light, he could see the ache in her eyes. The bitter memories of a luxuriant life and glittering future that had been snatched away from her at Endor. But alongside the ache was an equally strong determination. However badly this might hurt, she truly did want to hear it. The Emperor was trying to turn me to the dark side, he told her, long buried memories of his own surging painfully back again. It had nearly been him, not the Emperor, who died that day. He almost succeeded. I'd taken one swing at him and wound up fighting with Vader instead. I guess he thought that if I killed Vader in anger, I'd be open to him through the dark side. And so instead you ganged up on him, she accused, her eyes flashing with sudden anger. You turned on him, both of you. Wait a minute, Luke protested. I didn't attack him, not after that first swing. What are you talking about, she demanded. I saw you do it. Both of you moved in against him with your lightsabers. I saw you do it. Luke stared at her, and suddenly he understood. Mara Jade, the Emperor's hand, who could hear his voice from anywhere in the galaxy, She'd been in contact with her master at the moment of his death and had seen it all, except that somehow she'd gotten it wrong. I didn't move against him, Mara, he told her. He was about to kill me when Vader picked him up and threw him down an open shaft. I couldn't have done anything even if I'd wanted to. I was still half paralyzed from the lightning bolts he'd hit me with. What do you mean if you wanted to, Mara said scornfully. That was the whole reason you went aboard the Death Star in the first place, wasn't it? Luke shook his head. No. 
I went there to try and turn Vader away from the dark side. Mara turned away, and Luke could sense the turmoil within her. Why should I believe you? She demanded at last. Why should I lie? He countered. It doesn't change the fact that if I hadn't been there, Vader wouldn't have turned on him. In that sense, I'm probably still responsible for his death. That's right, you are, Mara said harshly, but there was a moment of hesitation before she said it. And I won't forget it. Luke nodded silently and waited for her to say more, but she didn't, and after a minute he turned back to the thorn bushes. I'd go easy on those things if I were you, Mara said from behind him, her voice cool and under control again. You don't want to trap us in an area this size if something big comes over the bushes. Good point, Luke said, understanding both the words and the meaning beneath them. It was a job to do, and until the job was finished, she still needed Luke alive. At which point, she would have to face the destiny that had been prepared for her. Or would have to choose a new one. Closing down his lightsaber, he stepped past March where the others were busy setting up camp. Time to check on the droids. Before we actually conclude this, for anyone who is uh, following this type of stuff, The Bad Batch Season 2 premieres at the end of this month, and we might see Wayland again. And Mount Tantus! Yep. Uh, that stuff was actually shown to us at the end of Bad Batch Season 1, and there were confirmations that that is, in fact, Wayland. So we're really excited for that. It just feels like perfect timing to be reading this. We'll see you next time. The Han said. The Han said. <laughs> the Han. <laughs>